Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Aging with Attitude. My name is Phil Koch. I'll be your host this evening. Tonight we have Leo Boland. He's the manager of Adult Social Work Services here in Mecklenburg County, right? Yes, sir. Mecklenburg County Department of Social Services. Fantastic. Well, welcome. Thank welcome. you. Thank you very much. Well, maybe first thing we should talk about is what are the components that make up Adult Social Work Services, the departments and components? Right. The Adult Social Work Services Department is made up of four components. The first component is the Just One Call, which provides information and referral for elderly and disabled adults here for Mecklenburg County. They also have the ability to look up resources in some of the other surrounding counties. Occasionally we get calls from other areas where people who live close to Mecklenburg County are looking for certain things, whether it be transportation or housing or food pantry, so we could, we're able to help them out as well. But Just One Call also provides the intake component for adult protective services. Okay. Adult protective services is the second component, and adult protective services provides an evaluation for individuals that are reported to the Department of Social Services where there's a concern for their safety, either for themselves or from their caretaker. Our third component is the guardianship unit. The guardianship unit provides for the care, comfort, and maintenance of anywhere from 290 to 300 wards. And these are adults in Mecklenburg County who the courts have determined are incompetent to provide care for themselves, and there's no one else out there to provide care for them. So the Mecklenburg County Department of Social Services does the care, comfort, and maintenance for those people. And our fourth department is our monitoring department. And our monitoring department works with the adult care homes, the assisted living homes here in Mecklenburg County to, on the front end, to make sure that they're following the rules that are established with their license for anything from client rights to environmental to medical to their to food and nutrition, right. as well as does the type of investigations if there is a complaint about the, the care that somebody received in one of these facilities. And that's important to mention because as I mean, there's a lot of buildings here in Mecklenburg County and the surrounding areas that if somebody had a complaint with regard to, they would approach Adult Protective Services. Absolutely. They would yeah. contact Just One Call. Or Just One Call. Right. We take all the referrals all in one place. The person doesn't have to shop around. We don't give them different numbers. Right. So if they're looking for some type of, of community resource, we provide that resource right then and there with a warm transfer, calling the, the whatever agency can help them out and, and trying to get them linked up with them, as well as taking the information from any of the, of the areas that we service, whether it be adult protective services, guardianship, or monitoring. So it's just one call. Right. And that's why it's called Just One Call. You make <laughs> one, and we try to service you from there. We don't try to move you around to a whole lot, bunch of different places. So what are the buildings that fall under the monitoring area? You had mentioned it earlier. The yeah. monitoring area is adult Sorry. care homes okay. and assisted family living right. and, and um, some of the smaller like group home types of, of situations. Right. Um, we don't do nursing homes. Nursing homes are licensed through the Department of Health and Human Services and those complaints also go through the Department of Health and Human Services. Right. Interestingly though, we could have an adult protective services in assessment for an individual who lives in a nursing home, right. even though DHHS is actually doing the complaint because it's a nursing home, but we would be looking at the individual, making sure that the individual is, is being safe and well cared for. Okay, let's say, would this even fall under you if, if Mrs. Jones had a mother that was gonna potentially need to move into a, a community in Mecklenburg County, would you guys be able to provide information on the different types that are out there, or is it really if there was a complaint, mostly? Oh, well, we can do that. Okay, um, yeah. We can't give out a lot of information because of confidentiality issues. Yeah. We couldn't say, you know, Mrs. Jones facility, if someone called and said, can you tell me about that? Right. We could tell them this is what they're licensed for, this is the, the, the type of, of client that they take, right. whether they take Medicaid, they don't take Medicaid, and that information a person could get through the Just One Call operator. Okay. Uh, but we wouldn't be able to give them specifics about have there been previous investigations. Now, all facilities in North Carolina are licensed by the Department of Health and Human Services. Right. So there is a website that a person could log into through the Department of Health and Human Services if they wanted to know about complaints and those type, that type of information. Because it is public information yeah. once it goes to the state and then the state puts it on the website. Okay. But we wouldn't be providing that out directly. And the guardianship area you were mentioning before we get in APS, 
are people that are out there that fall under that department that actually help what? What do the guardians do under that area? The guardianship social workers, when a person be, is, is deemed incompetent by, by the civil court, right. uh, means that, that they are unable to make decisions for their own safety and they can't provide for themselves anymore and there's nobody else out there that, that would be willing to provide for them. Right. Um, Department of Social Services, the state, is known as the last resort. So we, we try to explore family, we try to explore friends, and if there aren't any families and friends, then, then DSS becomes the, the guardian of the person. We, we don't, DSS is not a guardian of a state. We don't mess with people's money. Right. Um, we don't mess with their property. We're only there for the person. Okay. And what we would do is then find a, a facility for the person to live in that best meets what their needs are. If, if they needed total care, we'd be looking for a total care facility. Right. If they just needed uh, maybe assisted living, maybe some help with hygiene and some other things, um, medication, then we would try to, to find the least restrictive environment for that individual. There are a few individuals that we have where we, they're wards of the state, but they actually live in boarding homes because their functioning level is where they can manage. The boarding home is, the, the, the people who are operating the boarding home understand their needs and they're able to work with them. Right. So we always try to match the person to the best need in the most restrict, least restrictive environment. And then the guardianship worker will then work with whatever facility they're in or a boarding home to make sure that they're getting their food, they're going to doctor's appointments, they're, they're getting their medication, they're having regular dental checkups, they're having re regular mental, medical checkups. If they have mental health issues, they're seeing a therapist or they're taking their mental health medication. So we basically become their caretaker right. when, when they're a ward of DSS. Okay. And if somebody wasn't from that's a viewer tonight that is not in Mecklenburg County because you deal specifically in Mecklenburg County, right? Yes, sir. You would be able to refer them out to other counties or, or how does that work? Yeah, every county in North Carolina and, and every state in the United States has adult protective services and a guardianship program at, at some level. Right. Um, but in, in North Carolina, every county has the same type of guardianship program that we have here in Mecklenburg County. Whereas a person is deemed incompetent and DSS is appointed, then that DSS makes sure that, that we provide for the care, comfort, and maintenance of the individual. Perfect. Okay, so tell us more about some of the basic principles, you touched base on some of them already, regarding APS in general. Well, with adult protective services in general, one of the, the biggest guiding principle is self-determination. Okay. We're working with adults. And adults have the right to make good decisions, and adults have the right to make bad decisions. And we have to respect that right. We have to treat everybody that we come in contact with courtesy and respect. We have to, to look at them as individuals. We have to work with them and look at the situation that they're in. We want to make sure that the, with the individual, we're looking at the least restrictive environment as well. If an individual, an elderly person, is living in their home, and they want to live in their home, and they just need a few community resources to maintain that independence and be safe, well, that's what we want to. Right. We don't want to take that person and put them in a nursing home. We right. want them to stay in their home. But they might need a little bit of help. They might need an in-home aid. They might need a nurse. They might need some, maybe some homebound meals. Right. And if you can get those community resources in place, they may be fine staying in their home. And that's what we want to do. Right. But we also have to respect that if this person has capacity, which means they have the ability to make decisions regarding their own safety and they understand the consequences of their decision and they tell us they don't want our help, we have to respect that Okay. and we have to walk away. And a lot of times that's difficult. We may come into situations where the person's a hoarder or they're not eating right or they're not taking their medication, yeah. but they still have capacity and they don't want us around. They don't want DSS's help. We have to shut that case down and walk away from it. And it's difficult because you really want to help this individual and you want to put some resources in place that they could really benefit from. Yeah. But the, the number one guiding principle we have is adults have the right to self-determination. They have the right to make their own decisions as long as they have that capacity. And so that becomes very difficult a lot of times for the community to, to wrap its hands around. Yeah especially with, like, with the hospital and the police and the fire department, they go out to some of these homes and they see these people who are, they, they can't get out of their own bed or the, the situation in the home is, is, it's a hoarding home or there's cat feces or dog feces throughout the house. And, and, and it, to, personally, it's an affront. I wouldn't live this way. 
somebody's got to do something. But then they, on the other side of it, they have to understand if this person chooses to live that way right. and they understand the consequences and they have capacity, there's nothing that we can change for them. We can try. But if they say no and they stick to their guns no, then the situation is going to remain the same. Okay, so on that note, let me ask you something. So I own a home care company and we deal with seniors every day. We had a client a couple years ago who should not have been driving. The daughters didn't want her to drive. She refused to give up the keys. Now, in this particular situation, I'm, I'm curious to know myself, she was a potential threat to others. At what point would Adult Protective Services be involved in that, or was that really more a DMV thing? Because I know there's a lot of viewers, or some viewers that might be out there, looking at similar circumstances. Well, it's a difficult question to answer just with that little, right. that okay. brief of, it, of, of detail and information because there are criteria that we have to look at to actually screen in a report to have authority to be involved to do an assessment with a person. Okay. But let's just say for the sake of argument that we did accept it and that was one of the issues. Okay. Um, the Department of Social Services itself does not have the authority to, to tell a person they can't drive anymore. Okay. But DMV does have a provision in the law where there's a, a form that can be filled out and give to a physician to the person's doctor, and the doctor can fill out that form and send it back to DMV, and then DMV can take their license. Um, we have a lot of people that drive without license, so you know, getting the key and taking someone's license is, is two different things. Right. Um, but we don't want people who, you know, just like you wouldn't want a blind person driving, right? Because it's just not safe for them, and it's not safe for the community. And we would do everything that we can to try to put in in any type of of services that we can, like transportation. Yeah. Yes. You know, Medicaid transportation to get them back and forth to the doctor. Maybe an in-home aid that could help get them back and forth to the grocery store, so they wouldn't necessarily have that need to drive, which might ameliorate the problem. Exactly, and we're extremely fortunate with just one call in our county uh, to have a lot of resources out there to help somebody who, ne who needs transportation to and from places. Absolutely. Some being a very inexpensive, some being even volunteer in some regards. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's the, the volunteer um, transportation system that's relatively new, yep. and that's building, and they're getting more volunteers every day. And then you have, of course, you have the Medicaid transportation system, right. and then you have some other things through STS and through the Mecklenburg County transportation system for rural, people who live in rural areas. And, and so there are a lot of resources out there, and we can help people link to those resources by, through our Just One Call department. Yes. That's part of what they do with information and referral. Yeah, very, very key. Okay, so if they call up, what type of information should the individual uh, be sharing when they make that phone call into Just One Call or Adult Protective Services? For Adult Protective Services, just as with Just One Call, we would like to have the person's name okay. and their address because we, we have to be able to identify them and actually find them so we can try to provide services for them. Um, any type of, of collaterals, whether it be a doctor, an in-home aide, a nurse, a brother, sister, that might have some information about the individual would be, is, is helpful. Right. Um, because we want to do a holistic type of evaluation. We don't want to just go out there and the client says nothing's wrong. And then we find out from the doctor, well, you know, they've got diabetes and they're not taking their medication and they haven't been here in six months. Right. A lot of people are afraid of DSS. They're afraid that when we come out, they're going to a home. Yeah. And that's not our. That's not what we're trying to do. We don't want people to be afraid. Our one of our guidelines is least restrictive environment, keeping people in their homes as as long as we can. So, like I said, collateral information is great because a lot of times that fear we don't get the real stuff that's going on and how to help people. Yes. Um, medical information, if the, the caller knows anything, whether it be diabetes or uh, mental health diagnosis or you know any type of medical provider. And then the reason that they're calling, you know, the event. Why are you calling DSS? You know, what is the set of circumstances of the individual that makes you concerned? Right, right. But, you know, what I do tell people is that we don't necessarily, it's not a deal breaker if we don't have a name or we don't have an address. Uh, we've had situations before where it'd be like, it's, it's so-and-so and they lived under this bridge and they always wear a red bandana. And they're there from, you know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 5 o'clock in, in, in the evening. We'll go out there and we'll try to find this individual. So 
anything that will help us identify the person that they have a concern about, we'll go out and try to find. So it's great to have name and address, but it's not a deal breaker. That, that's a key thing, I think. That's a key point to make up because if you're a Joe Blow neighbor and you're concerned about somebody in the area and maybe you're a little shy for maybe not all justifiable reasons to give your name and telephone number, you can still call and make a report Absolutely. that could potentially affect the well-being health of somebody that's truly in danger. Absolutely, and, yeah. and you know, we often get reports where it's a concerned neighbor. It's like, you know, I don't know this person, I don't see them outside very often, I don't know what their name is, but they live in the, the greenhouse on the corner of such and such street, and you know, they're a, a, an elderly female. Right. And that's really all we need, and at that point, we'll go out and try to piece, you know, piece the picture together, find out the name, and do all those other type of things at that point. But you're right, there's a lot of times where people just have a concern and they give us enough information, we'll go look into it to make sure that this person's safe and healthy. And is it truly APS people driving out there and do they go by themselves or two people or does APS pick up the phone and call the police? I mean, how does that work? Typically, APS will go out, a social worker will go to the home okay. or wherever the person wants to meet. If they want to meet at dialysis or McDonald's or, or the mall, doesn't matter. They're right. going to go meet with this person. More often than not, it's individual. Um, there are going to be some times that the, we may send out two workers. If there's some information in the referral that con makes me concerned for the safety of the social worker, right. guns, dogs, drugs, we may send two social workers. Very often we don't involve the police. Um, the police are involved in some of the exploitation cases because there's a, a criminal act involved. But we also get the police involved if we do go out to a home and we find that there's drug sales. Or if we find something illegal, we will get the police involved, but generally we don't have the the police up front with us trying to make contact with the, the folks that are reported to APS. Right, right. And I think that's the general point you're, you're trying to make and that is APS is not here to get people arrested. APS is here to help people Absolutely. to pr provide guidance, provide advice and get them the help that they need, which in most cases are free. Right. Yeah, exactly. We want, to, we want to link people to resources. Right. You know, I, I said, I know there's a, a level of fear that they're going to, you know, take out of their home. And, and like I said, we don't place people. DSS doesn't have any placements. Right. So even with, if there is a person that needs to go to a, a facility because of safety issues, we're going to re be referring them out to community resources, to the facilities themselves. Right. And, and it's all about what community resources can we bring to bear? How do we keep this person safe in their community? And it's not we're coming out there and, and just yanking people out and putting them in, you know, old folks' homes. Which oftentimes in their community is still in their house. Yeah, oh, absolutely. When it, when and ever possible, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that that's the goal. Least restrictive environment. Keep them in their house if you can. Right. Okay, so tell me more about Screening criterias to accept an APS report, what would that entail? Well, there's three criteria that are required by the state of North Carolina. Okay. The first criteria is the person has to be 18. They have to be an adult. Okay. Or they have to be an emancipated minor, which means they're 17 and a half, they've gone through the court system, and the court system has emancipated them. We don't get many of those. It's, it's a lengthy process. So we're basically dealing with people who are 18 and older, and they have to have some type of, of disability. And when I say the word disability, you kind of have to set aside what you would define disability from the dictionary. Right. Um, disability for the context of adult protective services means they have some type of condition. And that condition impacts their daily functioning level, like diabetes. Most people would, would agree that diabetes is a disease, but if you were to say to your common person, is it a disability, the answer would probably be no. Mm -hmm. But for our purposes, we're looking at it from the standpoint of the person has diabetes, they're not taking their medication. So now they're having problems with ambulation, they're having problems transferring, they're not eating. And because of not taking their medication, their daily functioning is being impacted. So that's, when I say the word disability, we're looking at what is the condition right. and how does it impact their daily functioning? Right. Things like bathing, hygiene, toileting, grocery store, um, housework, those type of, of activities that a person does to maintain their own safety and their, and their own health. So that's the first condition. Okay. The second condition is there has to be some type of event. Adult Protective Services is not proactive, we're reactive. 
So there has to have been some event of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Oftentimes we'll get calls from the hospital or other medical uh, professionals saying, hey, next Friday the service is going to end, and when it ends, this is going to, this is going to be the set of circumstances. And we aren't able to, to do anything with that, even though we know it's coming. Right. And we totally believe what the medical professional is saying. We have to let them know we have to have an event. Nothing has happened today. Next Friday, give us a call. We'll be on it. Right. But because we're not reactive and we're proactive, there's got to be some type of event of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Okay. And the third criteria, <clears throat> excuse me, is they need to, be, need to be in need of protection. And that means that they're unable to perform essential functionality for themselves, or if they have a caretaker, the caretaker's not performing for them. So basically it's like, I'm not doing what I need to do to take care of myself, or if I have a caretaker, my caretaker's not doing what they need to do to take care of me. Right. And that could be medication, that could be food, I mean it could be a variety of things. Right. So those are the three criteria that have to be met for us to accept an APS evaluation. Right. And how many do you, I mean, generally speaking, how many would you get per week actual calls saying, uh, how many would call for a potential intake or, and how many actually trigger into a case itself? We roughly? average we average about 2,200 calls a year. Wow. And out of that 2,200, we take about um, 1,100. Um, the other 900 or so that, that we don't take, we do half of those we do what's called an outreach on, which means a person from our intake department, Mecklenburg County, will actually go out to the house and have a conversation to try to put resources in place with the person. Right. And, and they'll also do a, like a social work evaluation. And oftentimes they come back to the office and say, hey, we need to take this and screen it back in. Right. Um, so it, it, about a half, about 50% of the calls that we get for an adult protective services evaluation, we actually, at some point on level, actually turn into an APS evaluation and go out on. Um, we average about 100 a month. Okay, so, and 50% of those trigger into? Well, 100 is case. the ones that are actual APS oh, reports. Gotcha. sorry, okay. Yeah, we average about 100 APS reports that we're actually going out on a month. Wow, wow, all right. So tell me, what, what is the meaning of neglect and what is the meaning of abuse and what are the differences? Okay. Neglect, there's two types of neglect per the statute. There's self-neglect, which means basically I'm not taking care of myself. Right. I'm not taking my medication. I'm not, I'm not eating. What I, if I'm a diabetic and, and I'm eating every candy bar I can get my hands on or I'm eating a, a diet that's high in the stuff that I shouldn't be eating or, or I'm not taking my mental health medication or anything that you could think of as far as what I need to do to take care of myself. Okay. So if I'm not doing those things, that's looked at as self-neglect. Right. Caretaker neglect is, is similar in that if there's a person that has either formally or informally assumed the role of the day-to-day -day provision of the functions for a person, and they're not providing for those, then that would be a caretaker neglect. I'm right. not taking you to the doctor. I'm not giving you your medication. I'm not feeding you. Those type of things um, would fall under caretaker neglect. Abuse uh, is, is a bit difficult because part of the definition of abuse says willful infliction of pain or injury upon the client. And a lot of times you have to kind of, you have to look at that word willful because right. it is a statute. Yeah. So if somebody punched me in the eye, that would be a willful act. Okay. And, and you would look at that as abuse. But not moving a person who's bed bound and they're starting to, to get bed sores, is that willful on their part? Or is that something, you know, they just don't know any better? You know, so you, you kind of got to look at that fine line, even though you may still have an injury, a physical injury, you're looking at that fine line of did they willfully do it or is it just they didn't know any better or they didn't care? Right. It, it, it gets tough with that. Uh, the other part of the, the definition of abuse is unreasonable confinement. Okay. And again, you have to be careful with that because oftentimes we'll have caretakers who are providing for a person and they work. So they'll set the person up in the household, they'll lock the doors, and they'll go to work. That person probably shouldn't be left home alone unsupervised. Yeah. But it's not unreasonable. It's not like they put them in their bedroom and said, you stay in your room, I'll bring your meal to you, and I'll lock your bedroom door and you knock on the door if you want to go to the bathroom, that would be unreasonable. Right. So you have to also look at that. So like I said, abuse can be tricky because of the wording in the definition. Um, 
And then the other area that we look at, as I had talked about with the uh, criteria, is exploitation. Right. And exploitation is the illegal or improper use of a person, of a person or their assets. Um, a lot of people don't think much about like a, a labor trafficking. Uh, we had a situation where we had an individual that was living in an apartment and working for somebody who was trying to fix the apartments and they made 50 cents a day. So they weren't exploiting the person's assets, they were exploiting the person and making the person you know, do these things and, and, and uh, taking advantage of the, the person and their ability to work. And then you have the other side of the coin is when they're taking their money and they're going on vacations and, and instead of buying medication, they're out at, you know, buying bingo cards or they're buying, you know, scratch offs and they're not taking care of the person, they're taking the money. Exploitation doesn't have to be by a caretaker. Okay. Exploitation could be by member of the church, anybody who gets your, your information. And it's a criminal act. So with our exploitation cases, these are reported to the DA and we work in conjunction with the police department on those type of cases. All right. um, one of the biggest areas where people get confused with exploitation is, is we'll get calls and they'll say, hey, you know, they took Aunt Susie out, out of the, the home she was in and they brought her back home so she could pay the rent. And, and even though that might not be a great situation, and there could be other things going on, that in and of itself is an exploitation because Aunt Susie lives in the home and the rent is being paid. So she's benefiting at, at some level from the rent being paid. Gotcha. Like I said, there could be other issues. There could be you know, no food or medication and some neglect, but it's not exploitation. And a lot of people get confused with that. Well, that's a Really great information. And tell us again, telephone number and website to, it's going to be on the, on the, where somebody can reach out okay, if they the, want to hear more. Yeah, the telephone number for Just One Call is 704-432-1111. Um, just One Call also, if, if you lo just type in Just One Call, you'll get that as on, on for like a computer website if you wanted to link that way as well. Perfect. Um, or you can go through MechWeb and get in, in touch with the Mecklenburg County Department of Social Services. Perfect. Well, I think we learned tonight from Leo Bolin, Manager of Adult Social Worker Services here in Mecklenburg County that Adult Protective Services is truly here to help. And for all of our viewers out there tonight, there's APS, Just One Call, Guardianship, Monitoring, all of them are here free of charge under the services of Mecklenburg County. Leo is one of many people that are here to help. Pick up the phone, call Just One Call, Absolutely. ask how, how, they, how can they help them stay preferably at the house and move forward. But one thing for sure, all four departments and all, how many people work with, within the group of APS? With, um, with APS we have about uh, 15. 15. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fantastic. And I know myself for the different companies, we use them quite a bit. Yes, sir. So thank you very much, Leo. Appreciate it. I'd like to thank all our viewers. Please join us again for the next episode of Aging of Attitude. Thank you.